order the Pentucket Regional School District School Committee business meeting for October 17th, 2017. Roll call. Wayne Adams. Here. Joanna Blanchard. Here. Bill Buell. Here. Emily Dwyer. Here. Dick Hodges. Here. Andy Murphy. Here. Lisa O'Connor. Here. Chris Redding. Here. Dina Trotter. Here. 4.6. We're looking good. All right, Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? And we're set. Okay, minutes. I'll try not to miss any of them this week. <laughs> um, may I have a motion to approve the business meeting minutes from September 19th, 2017? So moved. Second. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Is that one? May I have a motion to approve the business meeting minutes from October 3rd, 2017? Second. 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 Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? All opposed? We're good. May I have a motion to approve the business finance and operations minutes from October 3rd, 2017? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? May I have a motion to approve the human resources meeting minutes from October 3rd, 2017? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? May I have a motion to approve the communication subcommittee minutes from October 3rd, 2017? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? All right. May I have a motion to approve the policy meeting minutes from October 3rd, 2017? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? And may I have a motion to approve the teaching, learning, and accountability meeting minutes from October 3rd, 2017? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Voila. The next section on the agenda, public comment. Would anyone in the audience tonight like to make a comment? And that's a no. All right, um, moving on. We're now going to move to the superintendent's report. Dr. Mulqueen's going to fill us in on a few things. Yep, thanks very much. <laughs> so um, tonight we have three things to, uh, to go through. Uh, one is the school building project. Uh, I want to uh, update everybody on our uh, SRO and also give Chris Kelly an opportunity to provide an update on her work here as assistant superintendent. So um, I thought I would start with our SRO, Justin Lindahl. Uh, just uh, in, in the event that <coughs> he and the chief might have other things to do tonight. And uh, so um, I just wanted to recognize Justin Lindahl for his good work here at, at uh, the district. He's been a, a real benefit for me already. Um, uh, occasionally we have issues that come up throughout the district and it's nice to have somebody right on site that I can uh, call or talk to. And I thought that Justin might be able to provide you with sort of a, a day in the life of the SRO <laughs> and give you a little rundown. And um, so I invited him here. And, and Justin, you're up. Hey, how are you doing tonight, everyone? So day in the life, what I do every day, a lot of people ask because it's a, it's a new position. Uh, I start the day usually greeting staff and students as they come in at 7 or helping with traffic. 
Um, once that's settled, I kind of check in on emails, whatever's going on in the day. A lot of my day I spend meeting with principals and guidance counselors. Those are huge resources as far as really getting to, to know what's going on. A lot of the stuff that, that happens, maybe student conduct wise and just behind the scenes stuff, they kind of handle and they, they know what's going on. It doesn't need to be brought to a law enforcement level. But I like to stay in the loop to see, all right, what are the, what are the frequent flyers? Who are they? What are they doing? What's, what are the issues? May not be something that law enforcement needs to deal with, but maybe something I can, maybe uh, we can work on building an educational program, maybe, uh, drug abuse, um, bullying, cyberbullying, anything really. So that, that and just talking with students really gives me the best idea of what's going on, what I need to focus on. It's, it's all new to me too. I mean, I've, I've been working in law enforcement for a couple of years, but in the school it's a, whole, it's a whole different world. So everything had to be kind of relearn and reset. So throughout the day, I mean, I might get pulled in um, into a different situation by a principal, a teacher, whatever, get called the radio over the phone all the time. Um, people pop into my office all the time, talk to me in the halls. Hey, I'd like to have you come in and, and talk to my class about X, Y, Z, we set something up. So some things I have going on now, uh, I just did a presentation, safety in the home and uh, on the street for the transitions class, which is a special needs class here at the high school uh, with Celeste Winter. I'm working on the upcoming Alice training, which is the uh, professional development. Fortunately, we only got seven signups for the district, but we're gonna run it and uh, make the most of it. Um, and uh, also, I think sometime this week, I'm gonna be doing a job shadow with one of the public safety uh, students. I, did, I was recently interviewed by um, one of the uh, writers for the school newspaper. So a lot of things going on. We have a, a lot of stuff planned for the page school and the free schools in town for Halloween safety. So it's all just uh, um, see what, what the needs are. I'm still learning. I'm, my, my biggest resource, like I said, is the principals and the guidance counselors. They really know what's going on, what's, what's happening and stuff. So it's been a lot of time with them and just I think everything's going well so far. And you're partnering with uh, the new assistant principal, is that right? <coughs> exactly, yeah. I've been working a lot with um, both new assistant principals, actually, Frank Kowalski and Jim Carlson. They've all been great. Yeah, very good. So are there any questions for Justin at this point? We'll have him come back and check in occasionally, you know, to give you updates. But we thought maybe to uh, have him come back, keep his, fr his face fresh in your minds and, uh, you know, his job responsibilities are evolving as he said and uh, I do really appreciate your good work here Justin it's been a couple times that I've relied on him yeah. and he's always been right there for me glad you're here great mm, thank you okay. thanks very much thank you guys okay um, next I wanted to go through an update on the school building project and tonight Andy and I think Brad Dorr will be uh, going through an updated version of the slides that you saw a draft version of. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring to your attention is that there's going to be a little bit of a field trip to two more schools, to visit two more schools, and everybody's invited. Uh, it would be up to you to make that decision. Um, so uh, one is uh, Dearborn Middle High School. It's a STEM-focused <coughs> high school, middle school high school in Roxbury. And that's going to be on October 30th from 9 to 11 a.m. And I can put this out in the Friday information to everybody just to confirm. And then another one is another middle high school. And it's in Situate. And it's going to be on November 9th. And that visit is from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, again, I'll put that out on Friday to everybody. And if you let me know that you'd like to go, that would be a big help. Um, one of these, I'm not sure which one, would like us to inform them about who's coming. Uh, the other one is more of an open invitation. Uh, so I'll put it out on Friday, but that's kind of one of the new um, opportunities that we have is to visit some schools. And much like we did last time, I think we came away with a lot of information. I think this would be good, too. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Brad and Andy if, if maybe we could proceed with the presentation at this point. Sure. Can I get that stick again? Sure. Uh, present tonight, but happy to see. 
see everybody. I see some familiar faces. Some people from building committee. Dave Hodges, good to see you again. Good to see you again. You did a fabulous job in North Reading. Well, thank you. For, for um, so we're excited to be uh, on the team. Mm -hmm. We've been working steadily away. And uh, Andy and John will give you a little update in terms of where we are, where we're going. <coughs> we generate a little excitement. Uh, it's been incredibly helpful um, working with Brad's team because they've been working us working at the time. So <laughs> getting, uh, getting the message is great and understanding what we want to talk about today or what we want to talk about six months from now. Uh, that's great. Yeah, so we have uh, two town meetings scheduled so far. Um, we have one on October 30th with Groveland around 7 o'clock, 7.15, and uh, then we have November 13th in Merrimack, and uh, Wes Newberry will get back to me, you know, and I'm sure they'll schedule something too, but those are the two meetings where we'll go and have this presentation and answer questions at those two towns. Is the time for the Merrimack presentation the same? 7 o'clock. Um, the reason I said 7.15 in Groveland is that's when they said they'd probably get to us in the agenda. There's one agenda item ahead of us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Just curious. <laughs> Jeff, what was that date again? <clears throat> October 30th, Groveland. November 13th, Merrimack. Sure. If you have like at 7 as well? Yeah. That good or that's good. No, that's good, I think. So we've never done this together before, so it's a little bit better to do it in real time here. Um, but as I said, mean, this is, uh, the goal here is just to get people the status of the, the upgrade on the school building projects. Uh, the, the, the content here is probably a little familiar, but a very different presentation, and I think it's really great how it's been approved. Um, so talking about the age of these schools and, um, you know, as, as we've said before, the, the high school is the flower of Eisenhower era construction. Um, Brad actually pointed out that the middle school was built when the Beatles re released Sergeant Pepper, so that, that's a good milestone <laughs> here as well. Uh, but the big mover point here is we're talking about major systems that are over 60 years old. They're more than double past their, their expected useful life, and when things are cut off and break down, um, finding replacement parts is incredibly difficult. Sometimes they have to be fabricated and it becomes a really expensive proposition. Um, it's what would expect from buildings of this age. We've seen a lot of maintenance issues, a lot of breakdowns. Some of the more notable ones, we had a, an evacuation due to a gas line leak. We had um, a water pipe that cost $300,000 to, to remediate. Um, and those are just two big ones. There are sort of ongoing um, issues popping up all the time. It's, it's a running joke about when the electricity is going to go out next day to day. Uh, this, this is just how life is in our current schools. And Andy, that um, represents both the flood inside and the water mark on the outside of the building for the, the, the water level inside. <laughs> for right. the flood. So the water was seeping out from the inside of the building. Yeah, so the, what you see there is about a three and a half foot, three foot level of water across uh, that water mark across the building. Yeah, and that the school might be in Houston. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's right. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned, with you know, these ongoing issues, you can see some of these pictures are really remarkable when you look at that electrical duct bag, uh, bag you look at the broken uh, primary cable. These are all things. It's, it's like in, in the big day when they were, were digging up Boston and they would find uh, old plumbing that was made out of hollowed out logs. I mean, we're not quite that old, but we're dealing with some pretty, um, some pretty archaic artifacts here. But beyond the, the maintenance issues um, are the educational issues. And when you think about in the school with design, education is very different from how it is today. Um, Back in the old days, when, when I went to elementary school and high school, you'd sit in rows and be lectured by a teacher and take notes, and the bell would ring and you'd leave the class. Today it's much more fluid, much more, more, more collaborative. Students need to move around, work in groups, uh, bringing uh, equipment, 
the, the classroom is a much busier place that requires a lot more movement um, and needs to be much more flexible to accommodate different programs. So when we think about how the current schools are structured, they're, they're really made for that sort of rigid old uh, form of education we all grew up with, um, not for today's more flexible environment. And it's the type of environment, you not only see it more modern high school structures, but virtually any college you visit, you're going to see that kind of mode of education. So when you talk about the education environment, what we're really talking about is are we going to be safe with what the kids are going to encounter in college or not? Right now, we're in a lot of things because of how the building is, is, is constructed. Um, there are also some really, so you, know, you can look at, at the um, our science lab versus the new science lab, and that's a good indication of, of what I'm talking about. If you look to the right, you'll see you know, the tables are all on wheels, the chairs are on wheels, things can move around very easily, it's open, it's airy. Or if you look at the left, stuff is pretty much fixed. Um, it's not made for movement. It's made for sitting at a desk and doing your work. And this is just one example about how design can impact um, the type of education um, the kids are getting. So, um, where are we today? What have we accomplished? This is just a quick timeline. If you go way back to April 2015, that's when um, Dr. Malt Poon and his staff uh, issued the initial statement of interest, which um, they did an excellent job on it. It was accepted by the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, and we entered what's called their eligibility period. And the eligibility period um, uh, basically involves having to get in lots and lots of information about the school. Um, which we actually did several months ahead of schedule in October 2016. And the good news there is we, we actually were ahead of what the typical schedule is for a, a school going through this process. So in November of last year, we actually went into the feasibility uh, study phase of the, the project. Um, and that's what we're actually in right now. And during that phase, we did things like forming the building committee. Uh, which currently meets once a month, and there's a subgroup that meets once a week on, on the building committee. Uh, we conducted hearings to understand um, what the public wants out of any new school construction project. And we complemented the hearings with, um, with surveys and, and online activities so we can really get input from the community. And that's something that we want to be doing on an ongoing basis. That's the reason I'm pretending I'm out of order so I can meet right now. We're here with you today. An interesting thing too is in uh, <coughs> last spring, um, Dr. Mulkey contracted with a group called Thought Exchange, and they specialize in creating interactive communities where school systems can get the input of the community um, through a really interesting surveying method where you can sort of grade different elements you want to see in the school system. Uh, we did one uh, thought exchange session um, last spring. There's going to be another one coming up in the next few months to get further input from the community. Uh, and then the other two big things that happened just in recent months is uh, Vertex, we selected them as our owner's project manager. That, that was done by the building committee. The building committee also uh, selected Dora to live here as the architect. Um, Anytime we say we selected it, actually has to go before the MSBA and be approved. So they, they ultimately are the selecting body. How about we switch off here? <laughs> Good job, Andy. <laughs> so now that we've kind of the details of the feasibility schematic design, so I'll uh, we'll kind of overview that for, for you now and do the for the selection when we get there. Um, as Andy said, we, these are these numbers here are the MSBA uh, modules. We finished module two and entered module three. It's it's their MSBA way of looking at it. Not necessarily the most clear, um, but it has a lot to do with contracts and starting and stopping of, of sections. Not necessarily the building. The main question that we've uh, begun, which you've hired us for, is modules three and four. Feasibility study and schematic design, and we'll describe this in, in a minute. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is at the end of schematic design, we end up with a number of description of the scope of the project and the cost for the project to then bring it to the towns 
into the MSBA to, to fund the entire rest of design and construction of the project. So the price is not known now, but it will be known at the end of module four, and that is anticipated to be next fall. Uh, and then we're actually then that MSBA approves that, we execute the project funding agreement, which is the mechanism by which you get reimbursed. Uh, and then uh, we'll start design and then construction starts. And depending on the option chosen, but this time it's wide open, you know, somewhere between 2021 and 2022, and that will be useful. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. When you say um, that we'd be ready to go to the town, say, next fall, mm -hmm. would we go to request money at the fall town meetings? Or yes, that would be fall? an exclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so one year from now, town meeting. More or less. Okay. It, may, it may not actually be at town meeting. So it, it may be a, you know, some other date, but right now we're just saying fall uh, of uh, next year. Okay. Yeah, we kind of worked out exactly when it's going to be. And so we have to go to each town and speak with each town and determine you know, how that's on the table. Okay. Right. And how these two models broken down the model? Oh, yeah. There so, it is. Sorry. So, uh, what are we going to be doing during this? Uh, you know, a big part is, is there's two tracks, the feasibility study, uh, educational programming track, and the physical building assessment track. We're going to be moving forward on both of those. Uh, and then engaging the community on both aspects. Uh, or communities, I should say. And that's very important. We've already had our engineers come out and look at both buildings. They are writing up reports on the condition of both the middle school and the high school. That's kind of the physical assessment components and we're working out. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be beginning the educational side uh, with a series of visioning sessions that uh, Dr. McQueen has sent out notice about. I um, encourage you all to not only attend, but to publicize this and get other people to attend. The broadest attendance will be the best for the project. Um, we anticipate students, staff, teachers, community members of large business owners, uh, because this will be the largest construction project in three towns, so everyone has a stake in it, whether they just children at school or not. Um, it, it really is the basis for, as the design team, what we're doing is we're soliciting information from everybody. We're also feeding people information, but we're really soliciting input of what works, what doesn't work, what are people's expectations, so that we can take that back and start to synthesize that as we start to work through your educational program and then as we take that and start to move that forward as part of the schematic design. So, you know, we really kind of want to put an emphasis on that, that we're really encouraging everybody to try and attend. And, you know, tell them about your friends because really what this is, is this is the first opportunity that the communities, plural, are going to have to be able to hear what's going on with the project, understand what the new opportunities are because a lot of times people get stuck with what they have they really don't understand you know what some of these opportunities are that are out there and we want to be able to share that kind of clean the slate so that everybody knows that they're starting fresh and really start to generate some excitement so that by the time we get to fall uh, of next year people are well informed right and that people are excited about the opportunity to really create change within the district and uh, well, we have a lot of experience with schools. We don't have any preconceived notion about what your school is going to look like. Uh, so that's what this process is about. And in the feasibility study, that's the goal, is to establish what is the right solution for Kentucky. Uh, there's a couple steps in that. The first one is both educational and physical assessment of, of your educational programming needs and your physical building needs. And then we'll develop uh, a range of options. Uh, some of those are mandated by MSBA as uh, they want us to look at a no-build option, at a renovation option, and most likely we'll look at a new construction option. Additionally, as part of this project, the uh, statement of interest included two grade configurations. So we'll be looking at both a 9 through 12 grade high school, as well as a 7 through 12 middle high school. What that means, how that's distributed, how that is laid out on the site is all up for grabs. Uh, but that's what we'll establish in the initial options. We'll talk about how Build the building or buildings might be located on the site. We'll look at options where there's partial or full renovation, on um, new construction. So that'll generate a, a whole long list of options. We'll show those options to the public. We'll bring those back to the building committee first, and, and probably want to update you guys at the school committee as well. 
give feedback, and then we submit that as an interim submission to the MSBA the, the PDP preliminary design program, where we have the educational program and a list of spaces, preferred grade configuration, and a range of these options. As an intermediate milestone, and then we go up through a selection process and whittle down. We have many there at that stage with maybe uh, some semi finalists. We take those semi finalists in the second half of feasibility and we whittle it down to one option uh, as a collaborative process seeking input. <coughs> we'll present that as well. That's called the preferred option. That will conclude, that will conclude this. No, it's not the right space. That will, the preferred option will conclude. Um, feasibility study. We'll submit that. Right now, we're planning to submit that to MSPA at the beginning of May of next year, which will put us online for a board approval in the middle of the summer, end of July. Uh, that you need board approval on each of these, <coughs> each of these milestones. That's why the MSPA numbers come into play. That approval will let us officially proceed into schematic design. As I said before, in schematic design, you need to detail the building more fully. It's not fully designed or engineered, but it's scoped out so there's, there's we can cost, basically so we can cost and price everything. And that's a number that we can take out to the towns and also to the MSBA. And as we do do design, they'll, they and you will hold us to that. So we'll, we'll do our engineering, we'll do our design work in the second part, but we'll always make sure that it's within the original budget set at the end of the schematic design. And we have some special cost, cost estimated with both vertex and uh, and Dorm Bridger will do uh, two estimates at all the major milestones, end of feasibility, schematic design especially, we'll then design, end of design development, 60% uh, CDs, and then 90% CDs right before we go out to bid is on that check. That allows us to make sure we're on, on target, especially after schematic design when the budget is fixed. And if we need to do any design adjustments, we can do it at that time. Uh, so here is a, a little more breakout of the feasibility and schematic design. I think we've covered most of those. Uh, like I say, the uh, preferred option, which ends feasibility, happens in early May. And then we switch over to schematic design. That will give us an opportunity to, uh, with the early May deadline, to interview teachers right before summer break. Uh, we need to do some more intensive programming. And we have to go off in bubble, uh, but most of the time administration uh, work hard over the summer and really detail it out we have to get everything down uh, dimension on the, the drawings and the square foot and have a fully developed uh, set of plans by september that can be priced and we can get a, a, a credit, the cost estimated for the scope and budget as i said in september which would set us up for an october msba board meeting and then town votes afterwards as Brad said it may not be at your standard town town meeting that's something you need to look out with the board selection. This is a, just another way of looking at um, in terms of describing what happens in the feasibility studies. I mentioned we will look at existing building conditions. We've already looked at that we're now writing that up. We measured those building uh, conditions not only in terms of industry standard and regulations, in terms of what we're talking about, but <laughs> outdated systems, but we'll also look at the spaces. And we, we have a diagram we usually do what we call the red, yellow, green diagram. We'll show that to you, but we measure spaces compared to the MSBA guidelines for a typical classroom, for a gymnasium, for all the spaces. Because we ultimately have to develop a, a list of every single space with its size. We track what's existing and what's proposed, and then get the MSBA to sign off on that. Um, and there's a little bit of art to that, and a little bit of science. Could you describe a little bit about the code upgrade option? Because I think it's important people understand that. The, the do nothing. Yeah, so, so that is mandated by the MSBA that the quote do nothing, but, but that doesn't mean doing nothing, it just means not building a new building. Uh, what you, and it's, it's meant to, to compare apples to apples. So it's not just the cost of a new school, but it's the cost of, well, what if you didn't build a new school? Well, the cost is, kind of what Andy sh showed in his presentation, is ongoing maintenance, last minute catastrophic repairs, the least cost-efficient way of dealing with things, both in terms of procurement of that fix and just the operational losses. Um, but we would capture that. 
We'll also be doing it when we get to schematic design. We have a uh, we have an actual design, a singular design. We'll do, be doing an energy model and we'll start to look at operational costs. We'll have some choices that we make collectively about what kind of mechanical electrical systems we use. And that energy model will be a way to evaluate the cost benefit of building envelope versus mechanical system A or mechanical system B. <coughs> really look at both the, the first cost, same the operational costs. So. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's important for people to understand there is a cost to doing nothing. Right. And they need to understand that that's a third cost we need to consider. You've already provided evidence for that. That 500 or 300,000 right. that you were talking about, that'd be a good thing to hang. I think though, Dick, you know, um, so we'll go back to that flood as an example. If um, the flood had been worse, if we hadn't discovered it at three o'clock in the morning, that was the Westonbury police that discovered the water coming out of the, we had a waterfall coming out of the door. If it hadn't been discovered, and if there had been a catastrophic, catastrophic failure of the building, you wouldn't be able to use it. Or if the electrical uh, fire that occurred had done damage and and the building caught on fire, it could have burned down. So it's not just a matter of a couple hundred thousand dollars. You could, in one night, lose the building and then okay. you're, you're going to be out of luck. Right. The do nothing option is about making this building shell work. But it would be about replacing the mechanical systems because you need to do that. They're out there, they're failing. You need to replace the electrical system. And then when you start to do that, the roof is, is at the end of its life. There are some exceptions, but once you get a certain body of code upgrade work to get things up to 2017, 1967, then you start to turn to ADA. Yeah. It's done over the threshold yeah. of work. So now you have to make it accessible. This building is not fully accessible. It's not up to the accessibility code. You'll be working out all your bathrooms. So we'll run through all that. We'll do we'll that in a lot of detail. But what you'll find is the cost of making a building as is with the rooms as they are, in other words, not improving education at all, it's going to be really expensive. And for minimal educational benefit, because it's, it's meeting an old, older idea about education. And education is uh, So we will develop preliminary cost estimates of feasibility study. These will largely be based on square foot costs of the major systems. As I said, we don't have a lot of detail at that point, but they're still fairly accurate. And they have excellent cost estimates. There's a uh, estimated contingency and some various factors that they go with them. But uh, surprisingly enough, um, it, it, that's a bit of the art to the science of cost estimating. It, they can come pretty accurate with just um, some very conceptual diagrams. And that will help choose which of the, of the options from uh, the feasibility stage you want to pursue as, as the singular. And that's the, that's the end of feasibility, is to select that preferred option. In schematic design, we will develop uh, line drawings that show all the individual spaces, size, so you can measure them against the school standards and what you have now. Uh, we'll look at the whole disposition of the site, how it can accommodate athletic fields, other activities, parking, the circulation, try to improve circulation if we can. We like to separate car and bus traffic, provide separate queuing areas for buses, not have kids walking across bus traffic. We want to accommodate athletic fields. We will be respectful of the investments we've already made in, in some of the athletic facilities and find other areas of the site. There's also some wetlands uh, and the riverfront uh, issues, but also opportunities. Uh, you know, one of our initial impressions for visiting the site is we have a fantastic site. It's amazing to be right next to the Merrimack River. But right now, it's not really engaged. And I think there's some real educational opportunity there uh, that if we kind of develop the site not pay it all necessarily, but just develop it to make it accessible that it's no learning opportunity. And um, if you come to situate, you'll see we did that there, we had a vernal pool, naturalized pool right in front of the building, and we, we built a uh, observation dock out into the pool. We worked with the conservation commission, got permission to do that. They were actually very supportive. And now uh, the teacher, one of the sixth grade teachers is working with her students to learn about what defines a growing pool, and they're actually going to get official, they're going to do the science, and then actually get officially registered as a growing pool. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. yeah. Very cool. <coughs> so 
So and then as, as I mentioned before, again, the schematic design will have a detailed cost estimate uh, so that we can establish the scope and the budget and, and bring that to both the NSBA board and to the towns for approval. Uh, and then that, um, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you know what the NSBA numbers it looks like that because I kind of skip over this. This is just one of the numbers. <laughs> but it's an awful lot of work. After schematic design, we've established the budget, we've established the scope, but now we actually have to engineer and design it. We have to really describe what those systems are, where the lights are going to be, what type of lights, what the finishes are, and lots of detail. Uh, so that will take us a year to do what we call design development and then construction documents. At the end of that, um, we'll be able to go out to bid and procure a contractor. Um, there's two phases to uh, procurement in mass public construction. There's a certain set of subcontractors who did it on their own. Uh, I think we talked about that uh, at the last building committee. They're called trade contractors who can choose construction manager at risk or the file subbidders who can do design bid build. Either way, they get bid separately and then their bids are rolled up into the general contractor or the CM's final price. That will happen uh, end and so that hopefully by the fall of, of 2019 uh, we can start construction a uh, groundbreaking ceremony there will be uh, regular construction meetings we do those every week with the OPM the architect mm -hmm. and the contractor or construction manager um, talking about that with Dr. McQueen uh, and we important for one or two representatives from the school or the building committee to be there that's a real opportunity to manage the process. Even if we do a new building uh, on this site, there'll still be a lot to manage. Manage the construction activity, be respectful of school activities. And, and, and mm -hmm. A lot of experience with that, but it's important to have good communication so we don't have disruptions to either construction or to education. And uh, so there'll be regular meetings, lots of work, about 24 months of construction, and then we'll be at a ribbon cutting for a brand new building, or essentially a brand new building, should we choose renovation. There's a bridge that needs to be Thanks a lot. That's yours. Any more questions? Do you need the lights? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a which one to show. I have a question. So, if the. Um, Right. So it goes to the MSBA, oh, yeah. the final, what's the final pricing yeah. is all done in October of 2019, right? 2018, 2018, sorry, 2018, then that's that, it goes to the MSBA board meeting for approval, um, and then comes back to the town, but they figure out exactly the town's shares. Right. Oh, um, so if it's not in time for what would be considered a regular town hall meeting, do you apply for a special town meeting? Is that there's, we'll talk about yeah. that more. There's lots of options. You can actually flip it. The, the standard way is, is and we, they really do proceed simultaneously because we have to inform the public about where we are. Of course. So we'll be doing lots of public meetings, talking about the costs, what went into the costs, what are the different options, why we chose, what we chose, and, and, and why it makes sense. So while we're talking to the public about that, we're also talking to the MSBA about that. Okay. So they're really simultaneous reviews. <coughs> And we'll be reviewing that on staff level with them, at, like, as I say, as we're going out to the town. So that the board meeting, in all cases, the way the MSBA likes to have things run is they want their architect and the OPM to know what they're doing, and then to talk to their staff so that the board meeting is kind of a rubber stamp, that things are already worked out by the time it comes to the board. <laughs> Looks like someone's going to play with more electricity. <laughs> Another squirrel bought it. <laughs> <laughs> By X number of days. Okay. Yeah, 120 yeah. days. But we have done we just did a project in Rally where the town actually voted first yeah. and then it went to the MSBA board. So that's acceptable, that's something we want you for. But the 120 days is, is a hard number. And we use that to uh, encourage towns to do things like that. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Uh, so lastly, I wanted to uh, uh, invite 
uh, Chris to make some comments about her new position and give you an update on her work. So Chris Kelly, you're up. Sure. Uh, did Mike pick me up here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for letting me uh, talk about that, Jeff and uh, the team. So it's been a busy um, six or seven weeks, I think. Uh, as mentioned this summer, I've been working on getting to know people in the community. Particularly, I've been spending a lot of time with the principals, which has been very helpful, I think. Um, having another person at central office to discuss day-to-day -day things and, and certainly strategic things has been extremely helpful. Uh, one of the things that I'm really struck by is the knowledge base of our educational leaders in this community, as well as the commitment and the energy they bring to the job. Um, I feel really blessed to be working with them. Um, they're very proactive, they're very, very reactive. Uh, Jeff and I speak to them almost daily, sometimes several times a day. Uh, it's a really collaborative network that has been fostered in this community, which I think is really unique and wonderful. Uh, the principals are very comfortable calling myself, Mike, Mike uh, Jarvis in the special ed department, Greg, Jeff, you know, the, one of us, all of us uh, at any time with a question, even a small question. So that's been really great. I've spent a, particularly a lot of time with the elementary principals um, and also with Ken Kelly. Um, definitely some time with with the high school principal. Um, in addition, I have been taking part of the weekly walkthroughs at the elementary level and at the middle school, high school level, um, which I think is tremendously helpful to me as a new leader to this community of getting a sense of the buildings, of uh, the strong things that are so evident, and then the things that we can continue to work on. So that's been really helpful. Um, I think part of that conversation, um, Jeff had worked on um, an inventory that we could look at that's been given out to the staff. So it's been really, really powerful. I don't know We're what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it's been really powerful to have the conversations, not just to do the walkthroughs, visits, but then really have the conversation with the building leaders. And sometimes the department chairs are there, sometimes teachers come, and really have those conversations. One of the things that has really remarked to me is that um, the staff are really starting to look for the same things we're looking for, which is great. Why is it doing um, this? I don't know why it's doing it. And then. Um, I'm just taking a picture. The fact that it's not evaluative, which is awesome too, I think really allows it, us to have powerful conversations of teaching and learning. One of the things that we keep coming around in all of the visits is the why. So we only see five to 10 minutes. You know, we're in a class, we see it at the beginning of the class, going over homework, we might see it at the end of class, we might see a powerful discussion, but then the question is always the why. So we could come into any part of a classroom and they don't know we're coming, and then the question is the why. You could have picked 15 things to do during that five minutes. Why that? Why this lesson? Why, why that moment in time? And I think that's the conversation that Jeff and I have been having with other leaders, and that's been great. Um, and then obviously doing some central office operational activities, helping with uh, grants and special ed things, uh, certainly helping Jeff with any kind of, uh, I don't know, any kind of paperwork or compliance well, we've things. Had, I think a couple of staff issues that have come up and Chris has been very helpful with, with that. Um, you know, in the past, uh, whatever the, the, uh, the point of conflict might be, um, because of our, our lean central office, it would come right to my attention. Now I have Chris, she can do problem solving with people and uh, so a lot of it doesn't come to my attention. I'm able to do the MSBA portion of my job a whole lot easier than I used to be able to. So I, I find that to be a real uh, benefit to us in central office. And then another big uh, component of my work is obviously working on curriculum work and professional development. Um, I know one of the strategic goals for the district is really looking at early literacy and looking to um, 
create help create a plan moving forward and look for consistency across the districts uh, at the different schools. So I've been spending a lot of time on that. Um, we're working on some uh, phonemic awareness training that we're bringing in. We're also uh, using some of our Title I funding to do not only some work in Merrimack, but really set up classrooms that other teachers can observe and work with uh, some consultants that we're going to be, that uh, Mr. Marino and I are going to be working with uh, in Merrimack. So I'm pretty busy. It's been great. Uh, everyone is super friendly in this district and very helpful. So uh, well, any time you start a new job, even if you've been in the field as long as I have, it's you know sort of hard to get up and running quickly. And being a lean central office and just in general, I wanted to really hit the ground running. And people have been great about saying, oh, well, this is this person, or this is how you do it, or this is where you go, or this is something that I worked on. Here's the historical piece of that. Um, and certainly the central office staff, including Mary Ann and the team there, have been unbelievably helpful because I do ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so, uh, so far, so good? Yeah, that's great. Excellent. Great, thank you. Thank you. That's the end of my report. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, on to new business. Um, so we're going to first discuss enrollment of administrators' children. Yeah, Bill, <laughs> did you want to take the lead on this? Did you? Uh, yeah, I just thought that uh, as we have extended health coverage to the administrators in the same uh, capacity and spirit as we have the educators and staff of the school, I thought it just very appropriate to include uh, if an administrator would like to have their children enrolled in the district subject to the same condition that uh, teachers are subject to, I think it's an invitation and I think it's a statement of, we have a very good school system, please come in. I think as w I know that a lot of our uh, upcoming administrators are younger, so if they have child care issues, instead of having to rush home, if they're comfortable having their children here, I, I think it's a compliment to us that they would like to send them here. So that's why I proposed this motion. And uh, we discussed this in the subcommittee, as you'd see in the, in the minutes. And what you have in front of you is really exactly a boilerplate of what the teachers have. And it's just a change of administrator uh, instead of teacher in the, the language. Okay, um, so can I have a motion that we extend um, to administrators the same enrollment of children benefit as we do to the teaching staff? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Okay. On to the next item. A modification of the excess and deficiency policy. Maybe Greg can take this one. Okay. Greg. Fill us in. So this was brought to the uh, policy subcommittee. There's an amendment to the E&D policy. Uh, a few weeks ago, a few meetings ago, you correctly, in my opinion, started an OPEB trust fund. Now, obviously in a district such as ours, funding an OPEB trust fund is pretty much going to be if you have any extra money and our extra money tends to be E&D. Our current E&D policy says that we will take that money and put it into the stabilization account. This amendment means it can go to the stabilization account or the OPEB account in whatever breakdown you guys determine during the budget process. So we'll be able to put it in two different places instead of one. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, can I have a motion to um, uh, modify the excess and deficiency policy um, as is articulated in the packet? Do you want to read the, so that there is a proposed motion. It says to amend section four of the excess and deficiency policy as per the proposal in the policy subcommittee. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I missed that one. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Uh, may I have a motion to amend Section 4 of the Excess and Efficiency Policy as per the proposal of the Policy Subcommittee? Make a motion. Second? Second. Second. Any discussion? I have a quick question. So what would be, like, the investment policy for this? At this point, stabilization is just in a regular 
checking account? Uh, stable, no, stabilization account is in a CD. A CD. But okay. we do it, in, but right now there's virtually nothing in it because we've drained it for the right. <laughs> policy. But during the investment is, is more, if they get, we run it into three months CDs, we kind of roll it around okay. just to keep it available as quickly as possible. Right now there's really nothing in it, so right. it's just kind of so sitting if, there. So if the intent, so stabilization is more in and out, whereas this, the intent is to put it in and then not bring it back out because we're funding well, the, the future. In, the intent of is the OPEP trust fund is to take it out should it become needed. What they want you to do is to have enough money as people, more and more people are retirees. Right. And your, how can I put this, your, your obligation to the retirees can sometimes outweigh your budgetary capacity mm -hmm. that you could use this fund to back that up. Right, so I guess... Bit. My question is, because Crest is doing the same thing right now, right. that they're actually investing it in, yeah. in something with a slightly higher return, oh, no. slightly more risk, but certainly not anything risky. So would it be something that the balances would accumulate enough that we would want to think about that? So sure. that we're not constantly putting money in, but it's making money on its own instead of like uh, half a percent, like right. regular accounts. When we account. created the OPEB trust fund, there's a second phase to it where you can create a committee, an investment committee for it. Okay. We, we, we passed it. We just put it under the control of the treasurer for now. Right. Just to create the fund right. because there's no money to really talk about now. Right. So after we get through the next budget cycle and we see what our E&D certified is, hopefully in the next right. couple months, we determine how much will go to stabilization, how much will go to the OPEP trust fund, then we can determine if we want to create a committee to do uh, how to right. invest. That it. or hire someone from outside, I think, makes the most sense. You can, or you can actually give it to the state prim board and they'll invest it for you as well. Okay. Sometimes that's what most people most are doing do now, okay. letting the state. I guess that's my point, is I don't want it just kind of sitting there, no. not doing anything, right. if it's available money. No, for right now, it just gives something. us the policy to put something in. This is this is right. to, so it gives us a funding source to put money into right. it, and then after that, we can determine how the investment will go. You said whether you want to vote to give it to. Just prim. as long as we do that second, second phase, phase yes. We start funding it. Oh yes, just yes. Sit it there. No, I wasn't going to let yeah. sit there. Point oh one percent. No, I'd lose sleep at night doing that. Okay, <laughs> okay. great. Thank you. Any additional discussion? All in favor? All opposed. Okay, next item, the uh, language policy. Uh, this was a policy that was discussed at the policy subcommittee, and um, it's um, primarily tied to our application for international baccalaureate approval, uh, but not exclusively. It also talks about the obligations of the district for second language learners and uh, the value of language with rich classrooms um, more generally. So um, the policy subcommittee is recommending it for your approval. May I have a motion to adopt the Pentucket Regional School District language policy as proposed by the policy subcommittee? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes. I have some questions. Uh, who pays for the 15 hours? Uh, I need to be a little bit more specific for me. I believe it says that uh, educators are required to complete 15 hours of professional development in the area of SEI. Yeah, so we provide that for free here. I actually okay. run that course. Uh, we also uh, run a course for the 15 PDPs of uh, special education. We have a couple of courses that we're running. Uh, Mike Jarvis is running one. Uh, Melissa McElhaney's running one. Uh, so the district is obligated to provide these free of charge for teachers so that they can become certified. I also uh, had a question about is um, you have the language teachers who are exempt from this based on their own training. They do not need, they just audit their certification. For a teacher who's teaching Latin, um, I. I don't see the connection with ESL at all. I had four years of Latin, and I don't ever remember speaking it. I can tell you a little bit about Cicero. Yeah. This is more about how students who, have, who are not English uh, language uh, proficient um, have additional supports in their classroom based upon the strategies teachers would learn in these kinds of uh, classrooms, uh, this kind of training dig. So it's not so much about 
language training as it is about how to give access to students who don't have uh, language proficiency, English proficiency. How do you make accommodations for them? And uh, what we find is that the, sim the simple accommodations that can be made are good for everybody, not just for the second language learner. So it's, it's not actually a very complicated um, process for a teacher to learn, but it's more about awareness and sensitivity and learning some strategies that apply to everybody, you know, more generally than just um, particular students. This probably would not happen in the Pentucket area, but I have graduate students in Lynn where uh, Guatemalan children uh, came in. They just came in. Well, Guatemala, there are five different dialects. If that hap I mean, they do not have translators for all of those children. And the sad thing is they are learning what a shower is. They're learning how to use the bath, just basic life skills. They're not getting to three times two. Uh, at all, um, and I, I just have this this sense that this is something that could be done without the the uh, state uh, putting more on on the uh, uh, more on the teachers. Uh, I think they're already overburdened with a lot of things. Uh, uh, final could question. A, could I just offer a point of clarification sure. for you? So it's actually the federal government, not the state. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, we need to back up to the federal government putting pressure on Massachusetts, who's putting pressure on the local districts. So um, I, if you had some experience as I have in, um, in uh, an urban center in Massachusetts, you'd know that a while back they were connected pretty uh, tightly to the uh, federal government um, because of the inadequacies of their systems in providing supports for second language learners. And what happened, Dick, was those systems said, well, we can't enforce anything because the state is the, one, is the enforcing agent for us. Mm -hmm. So we can't do anything that the state doesn't support us on. So then the federal government went to the state, and now the state is coming for everybody. So it's really the federal government that's putting this pressure okay. on. One final question. There's a... Uh Language in the uh, classroom, learning is differentiated in the classroom in a variety of ways. Elementary students are individually assessed in their reading ability using contemporary assessments and in, uh, instruction strategies. What happens when a student falls below grade level? What do we do? Do, do we do Wilson? Do we do Orton Dillingham? What yeah. exactly do we do? So um, what is good to, uh, to keep in mind is that we tailor to the student's particular needs. So there's not a generic approach that applies to everybody who's having a difficult time. So the new uh, reading assessment that we're doing, the Houghton Mifflin Reading Inventory that we actually just started this week for our students in grades one through nine, it will provide us with information on reading levels that equate to generally where a person should be in a grade level. It's based on semantics uh, and syntax. So semantics is the meaning of words, the vocabulary, and syntax is the construction of the sentence, the complexity of the language. So when you um, assign a lexile value, a lexile range to a student, it provides them with an opportunity to bump up their reading level, these reading texts, and continually strengthen that reading muscle that's being developed over the course of time. Students who fall or who are not um, comparable to their peers at a particular grade level will have supplemental instruction and occasionally for students who need very uh, tailored instruction, special education supports would be provided for them, but that would be tailored to meet individual needs and that would require more detailed assessments, analytical assessments, uh, much in much greater depth than our generic screening tools can provide. Okay, I'm glad you explained that because I was going to vote no on this until I, I heard that um, this is going to be done in-house yeah. yeah. as opposed to having to go out because that's just another thing for teachers to all do. Of this is that list gets longer and yeah. longer and longer. All of this is, is right here okay. uh, within the district. Yeah, so I'm so glad I was able to explain that to you. I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>
Any more discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Okay. On to our next item, family engagement policy. And uh, family engagement is, um, is important for, for all districts, but in this case, it's more of a, an effort of compliance with Title I. So although I support family engagement generally, this is a, an effort in compliance for us. So um, I encourage you to uh, approve the district's family engagement policy so that we're in compliance with Title I. And uh, this too went to the uh, subcommittee for policy and they're recommending it. May I have a motion to adopt the Pawtucket Regional School District Family Engagement Policy as recommended by the Policy Subcommittee? So, so second. Any discussion? Question. Uh, I mentioned at our last meeting that the RAND Corporation has um, evaluated Title I for decades and they have basically flatlined. Uh, this is a wonderful engagement policy. Could we do this without Title I? Do we need Title I in order to do exactly what's stated here? Well, that's what I was saying, is I, I would be recommending this sort of thing to you anyway, but uh, Title I is requiring it, and so we had to put some attention to it right away. So that's why, why I uh, introduced it as a, a good idea generally, but it is an effort in compliance for I, Title I think it's a wonderful <laughs> policy. I just, uh, I'm, I'm a little tentative about Title I. I, I understand. If we were to invest a lot of money uh, in the stock market uh, for decades and I end up with 50 cents after I've invested uh, 10,000, that's basically where we are with Title I. I'll be voting no on this. All right. Any additional discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Okay. I think if it doesn't pass unanimously on first read, it has to come back again. Yeah. I have a question then. <laughs> um, the second paragraph, right before the Title I Parent Involvement Program, it says additionally, parent involvement, uh, next line, parent teacher organizations, the school Coulter program? Is that a word? Or is that which which uh, paragraph are you on, Chris? Right, below, right above where it says Title I Parent Involvement. Okay. So, like the second. Is there a type? Or well, I, that's what I can't tell. The school. Is this supposed to be culture? culture. Oh, there, there is something called culture. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't know I had to look it up on the internet because I saw it too. School culture program? How about if I, uh, okay. I'll take a yeah. look at that. I don't know what that means, so. Yeah, I'll I look, perhaps I'm just uneducated on that. It did, it did mean something. I looked it up on the internet. Oh, I read the culture program. It was. It was an educational thing. Well, you don't remember thing. what it means, Jeff <laughs> No, I just, wanted to make, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a typo. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll take a look, Chris. Right, thank you. Happy to. Okay, next item E in new business, uh, Pawtucket Association Chief's Memorandum of Understanding. At the, um, the conclusion of our contract talks, um, these four items were action items that needed to uh, take um, some committee time in the upcoming uh, year or so. And um, typically, Greg and I would take the lead on that, but I did want to extend an invitation to any of you to participate if you'd like to. The, um, the limit is for a team of four, and the union would also be bringing a team of four. Uh, so I didn't know how or if you wanted to participate, how you would want to uh, make those decisions, but um, this is something that we need to attend to, and uh, the union is also uh, gathering a team of four uh, to participate. And when you say team of four, the team would be, I assume, yourself? Well, typically in the past it's been uh, Greg and I that have gone to represent uh, the district, mm -hmm. uh, despite whatever the numbers are from the union. Uh, but I did want to invite anybody who wanted to participate, or if you all want to do that on your own, you're all welcome to do that too. I'd be interested in participating. I potentially would too, but that's entirely dependent on when the meetings are. <laughs> so, I, nothing's no. been said yeah, yet. No. Mm -hmm. 
Um, shall we, anyone else who might want to participate, say, uh, email you in the next 48 hours or so? Yeah, and then you and I can talk through that. Yeah. <coughs> All right, next item, school committee goals. Thank you to those of you who sent me your um, input from the workshops. Um, for those of you that didn't, if you could get those to me uh, soon, that would be very helpful. Um, I think I have enough stuff now, though, I'd like to move ahead and we can get together and collaboratively develop a draft that we can then give to everyone to look at and ruminate on. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we now um, need to call an executive session. We will not be coming back, and it is to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. May I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. Uh, <coughs> Roll call vote. Wayne? Yeah. Dick? Here. Joanna? Yes. Bill? Yes. Andy? Here. Lisa? Yes. Chris? Yes. Dina? Yes. Emily? Yes. Okay.